Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 98. Walt Disney World's Biggest Eyesore. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my informed and entertaining co-host, Michelle Whalen. Okay, I'll go with that. Well, you're both of those, aren't you? Depends on the day. Well, you did the show notes, so by definition, you're <laughs> so informed. So by definition, I am informed. Whether okay. or not you're entertaining or not, well, that remains to be seen for the show. We'll see. Da, 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 da. Hey! There, that's a good there start. There we go. See? Get the jazz hands going. <laughs> The jazz hands going. So, how was your week, sweetheart? Ugh. That good, huh? Short weeks are always the worst. Yeah. Why was this week short? Because I was off on Monday. I actually had a holiday on President's Day. Oh, yeah. Some of us actually had to work on President's oh, Day. Oh, but that's okay because some of us made up for it for the rest of the four days. Well, so. that's good. I'm so glad you made up for it. <sighs> Yeah, and a migraine, too. Woo. Awesome. That makes the day go by faster, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> needless to say, I was happy the week has, has ended. So. All right. Yeah, I, th I think we all are. Mm -hmm. So, in today's episode, we're going to talk about uh, Walt Disney World's biggest eyesore, like the show title today. Uh, but it looks amazing now, apparently. Mm -hmm. So, we'll, we'll see. Yep. Uh, there's some big park landmarks that are getting a makeover for the 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. Then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, we'll talk about a new Secrets of the Sith book coming out later this year. And we'll close the loop on our article from last week about uh, whether or not the Cara Dune role is going to be recast or not. In our entertainment news. Uh, love isn't so eternal. <laughs> we'll leave that one hanging there. Yep. Uh, the Walking Dead might feel a little bit different uh, this year. Uh, this season, rather, for their, what's it, season 11, I think, right? Uh, well, it's the second half of 10, but also part of 11. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. <clears throat> uh, and then we'll talk about uh, what happened to a special wardrobe and how it's helping out others now. Mm -hmm. And then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. Ready to get into it? Sure. All right. faster nice yeah, i like that's, it that's pretty good there nice. isn't it that was nice go for disney detective so walt disney world's biggest eyesore is back and it kind of looks amazing so walt disney world is an incredibly creative place where some truly amazing concepts have come to life and however not all of them have been great the concept for Leave a Legacy wasn't that bad. Um, as part of the Walt Disney World um, Millennium Celebration, guests had the ability to commemorate their visit by leaving a small image of themselves at Epcot that would be there for years to come. Unfortunately, the display of those tiny monochrome pictures left something to be desired. The entrance of Epcot became a series of big, giant granite monoliths covered in gray and black titles. It was less than exciting to be the first thing that you saw when you first walked through the gates. You know, as you can remember, you, you know, you walk through the gates and then you just saw these big, giant gray monoliths with these little tiny pictures on it. Um, so it really, you know, 
wasn't very attractive. So as part of the massive redesign for Epcot that is currently underway, they had removed all of the Leave a Legacy uh, blocks. But because guests were promised that their images would remain on display for 20 years, we knew that they were going to be placed someplace else because, you know, they they said they weren't going to totally destroy them. They were just going to put them someplace else. Um, So they actually did a whole new redesign of it. And now it's actually in color and it looks really pretty. So as you went through the story, there were some uh, pictures of how it is. So instead of it, you know, kind of blocking the way, it's kind of leading the way and it's all colors and, you know, all nice and and pretty uh, and not this gray, you know, blahness that that it was. Um, so obviously it's it's, um, you know, it's been there for a while. Uh, the program actually ran from 1999 until 2007. And now anybody that had participated in it, um, you'll be able to scan a QR code to be able to find where your picture is, because obviously now things have kind of been, you know, moved around. Um, so, um, so this is part of, you know, Epcot's 40th anniversary, the, the, you know, the, the revamping that they're doing. So this was one that has now been completed. So, so now with this, they were not opening it up to new ones. Right. It wasn't, nobody was getting any new ones and they, they never said how long, because you figure for, you know, people that have had it since 1999, their 20 years is up. Like I actually have a photo there. Um, and it's been there for over 20 years now. So, you know, I honestly didn't even realize it was supposed to be there for 20 years. Um, I also had a stone um, in the walkway, which <laughs> got all ripped up uh, last year um, in Disney, uh, you know, with redoing uh, various things. And with the bricks, they basically just threw them out. They destroyed them. They didn't even give people options. The only thing that you, you could, could do, a, you could, you could get, get a, a commemorative, commemorative version brick, yeah. Or if you never bought one, you could get one um, <clears throat> made. Whereas with uh, the the picture, it's a metal picture, so it's not like they'd cut it out. You know, I, I couldn't see them cutting it out and hey, you want to mail it? You know. Mm. Um, but you know, it's still kind of cool to be you know part of the the park. And it's a shame you're not a permanent part of the park, though. Right, right. I'm only temporary. I'm only you're allowed temper. to you're be a there. Temp. I'm you're, a temp. You're a temp. I'm a 20 year temp, no yeah. less. Well, you know, <laughs> how long you been at your current company? <laughs> 21 years. Thank you very much. There you go. See. <laughs> All right, well, that's kind of cool. At uh-huh. least they brought them back in there, and, and they're not getting rid of them at this point. Because yeah. it, it was kind of neat walking in Yeah, there it was definitely seeing. neat. And I have a funny story. So I, when I got my, my first one done, I was married to, to someone else. So our picture is there. And we had gone on a vacation with a friend of mine as well. So the three of us actually got our picture. But you could only have two or one or two people in your photo. But as it turned out... The way because we took ours in succession, you got to see the three of us together in in a row. Well, you know, couple weeks after it had gone up because we took your picture, we took our picture, but it didn't go up until weeks after, you know, we had already returned home from our trip. Um, So couple, you know, months later or whatever, a friend of mine, Chris, uh, who lived and actually at the time worked down in Disney, happened to be down there, you know, going to the park after work one day. And he had another friend of his who had gotten his photo taken. And he was like, oh, can you go and look for my photo? Here's where it should be. He goes and looks for it. And here's his friend. And there we are. We were like three rows up. So we had obviously taken our picture within, you know, a couple of hours maybe of each other. And Chris just thought it was kind of cool because he had, you know, this area where he knew, you know, six people (laughs) in one little, you know, spot. So that was kind of a, a cool little thing. So tell us about the makeover. 
So, Walt Disney World is going to give Cinderella Castle and under other park landmarks a makeover for the 50th anniversary. So, they had just announced uh, last week um, that the world's most magical celebration will be kicking off October 1st on Walt Disney World's 50th anniversary and will run for 18 months. Walt Disney World's historic landmarks are getting a royal makeover in honor of the upcoming mo- world's most magical celebration. Um, on Friday, Disney Parks unveiled artists' renderings of the four park centerpieces, Cinderella's Castle at Magic Kingdom, the Hollywood Tower of Terror at Hollywood Studios, Spaceship Earth at Epcot, and the Tree of Life at Animal Kingdom. They said as part of the celebration, Cinderella's Uh, castle at magic kingdom park will add to its royal makeover from last year they had started to uh, repaint and everything so now they're going to be adding a little bit more um as you can see from the the different renderings um and then when night falls the castle and the landmarks of the other three parks will transform into beacons of magic adding a shimmering optical element to each like pixie dust on cinderella's castle and magical fireflies that will inhabit the tree of life Epcot Spaceship Earth will get new lighting on its reflective panels over the iconic sphere's surface, resembling stars in a night sky. That addition will actually be permanent, lasting beyond the 18-month celebration. Um, Also, as part of the lineup, Mickey and Minnie will be sporting new coordinating fashions featuring iridescent fabric with gold highlights. Uh, Disney Parks unveiled their landmarks new look, uh, which comes seven months after uh, we saw the other update to Cinderella's Castle, which was ahead of the opening after, um, you know, the the, uh, pandemic. Um, And uh, they were first announcing early in 2020 that they were making all these changes to Cinderella's Castle to coincide with the 70th anniversary of the release of Cinderella. Um, so they're, it's getting a fresh coat of pick. It's getting a fresh coat of blush pink paint to its upper interior walls, royal blue rooftops and turrets, and also a bolder look with adding some gold ornaments as well. Okay. Well, would be nice if we can actually get down there and see it though, wouldn't it? Well, we got 18 months. So, and it's 18 months as of October. So there's a so chance. There's a chance we, a we chance. might actually get there because you figure it'll start in 2021 and it'll go through all of 2022. So, yeah, that would, we could probably pull we that off. We could probably pull it off for next. Assuming the zombie apocalypse has subsided by then. Here's to hoping. Yeah. So that was all we had for Disney Detective. Mm-hmm. We'll be back in a minute with our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Peppy. Very nice. I like it.
go for Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. So we had uh, some, some news come out that it seems the Secret of the Sith from Insight Editions has announced that uh, a new book is going to be coming out and it is available for pre-order. Um, it seems in 2019 they actually came out with the Secrets of the Jedi book and now the same authors are coming out with a Secrets of the Sith. So it is told from the perspective of Darth Sidious, the Sith Master, um, who will guide you through the history of the Sith. Um, the person that wrote the article talked about there was a lot of interactive features with the secret of the Jedi book. So he's hoping that they kind of do the same thing um, with the secret of the Sith and how they're going to address, you know, all the other uh, Siths in the story like Snoke and Kylo Ren, um, you know, and and whatnot um so the team at inside editions always delivers on uh, this sounds like it'll be no exception uh so the again the same uh artist and writer who wrote the secret of the jedi are working on on this as well um so it talks about how you know join emperor palpatine otherwise known as darth sidious in the exploration of the sith and the evil allies of the dark side star wars the secret of the sith w sith say that five times fast Woo! will thrill young fans with dark side knowledge incredible artwork and an interactive feature such as pop-ups booklets and uh, lift the flap inserts. It almost reminds me of some of your other Jedi books that you have and some of your other Sith books that you have that are, you know, that interactiveness where you open it up and there's, you know, you lift this flip and that flap. So it kind of sounds like this might be a really good anniversary present, maybe just to say in for you. Sure, I'll get it for you. <laughs> like you really want it. <laughs> No, for you, silly. <laughs> um, it's obviously the perfect addition to any Star Wars library. It's beautifully bound, a uh, hardcover book, um, and it will be available August 3rd, but pre-sales are available now. Sounds good. Yeah, the other ones that we have in the series actually came, the first editions came in okay. the commemorative holders. Okay. So the one has the, the one Jedi one, um, had the case that it came in that you pushed a button and it automatically right opens. right 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 the sith one came in the the, the pyramid uh, right the model holocron right data okay. con cube mm -hmm. and that opens up automatically and presents the book right so you know they do a very good job of of how they package it so i'd be curious how uh how they're going to package this one mm -hmm. so but hey anything anything sith is good well and that was what kind of caught my eye it was like yeah jedi pfft. Exactly. But it was Sith. Yay! Yeah, Yay we, we are Sith. not supporters of the Jedi. Shh, we don't. <laughs> we don't do that. So let's let's uh, close the loop on our uh, Cara Dune story. Are they going to be recasting her? Nope. <laughs> Well, that's about it, huh? Okay. <laughs> that's about it. So it seems a Disney spokesperson says uh, that Cara Dune will not be recast in The Mandalorian. Obviously, um, that was the big news that, that came out uh, the other week. Um, and it kind of left Star Wars fans wondering whether or not her character uh, was going to be recast. There were, you know, various different outlets, you know, that kind of said, well, maybe you could, maybe you don't, maybe you just kill off the character. What do you do? Um, so now a Disney spokesperson has confirmed that Cara Dune will not be recast. The Hollywood Reporter had originally claimed that insiders were expecting Cara Dune to be recast because of the story and merchandising reasons. But now a spokesperson says that won't be the case. Um, I know there was a separate headline that I, I briefly saw that uh, talked about Hasbro actually pulling uh, off of the shelves or out of production any toys uh, that they had with with her. Um, so again, I didn't 
pull any of those. I just kind of saw them um, in passing. So um, the Hollywood Reporter had changed their initial report on the following, where they had said a Lucas uh, source says that the Cara Dune role is not expected to be recast and that she was not part of the December 10th presentation, nor was she engaged in negotiations for future work. And when they talked about the December 10th presentation, that was the Disney Investor Day where they uh, were talking about about different things that were going on with the studio um, and with the different uh, spinoffs, because as we had heard or rumored, she was going to be part of Rangers of the New Republic. Um, there was also talk that she was going to be in the, you know, the Boba Fett story at some point in time. So obviously now all of those uh, future projects for the character have now just been done, gone. See you, bye. It's unfortunate, you know, like we said last week, the character itself was a very strong mm -hmm. uh, role model type character. But, you know, you you say things and you do things in a public environment yep. that get you into trouble. Now, mm -hmm. you know, granted, she's entitled to her opinion and she's mm -hmm. entitled to think what she says. But when you work for a company like Disney, you're not right. entitled to say whatever you want if you want to stay under contract. Right, exactly. And Disney was well, you know, there there were a couple of other articles where, you know, she was kind of going off at the mouth again, saying, you know, that Disney was the real bully and everything and blah, 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 blah. Well, there are other, you know, she or there have already been talks that she already has other projects lined up with other producers and other directors and stuff and that's fine that and and good for her that she you know hasn't been blacklisted yeah you I know mean, that she disney, found something she's just not going to work for disney disney has anytime soon. a very specific mm -hmm. type of audience that it goes for absolutely and if you're not going to tote the disney line and and that's that's anything. That's Disney movies, oh, TV shows, mm -hmm. the you know, theme parks. Theme parks, yeah. I mean, yeah. even cast members in the stores. Mm -hmm. If you're not going to tote yeah. the Disney line, then you're welcome to leave and go work somewhere mm -hmm. else. Yeah, and, and that's really what this was. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. because of the subject matter involved, it's becoming more of a political thing right. than uh, you know what the company prefers its spokespeople to be. Right, exactly. So, but, you know, we wish her well. I'm mm -hmm. sure she'll land on her feet and she'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that was it for our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. Mm -hmm. We'll be back in a minute with our entertainment news of the week. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Dum 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 dum. This is the interactive, entertaining portion of the show. It apparently entertains you. That's for sure. It does. I don't care. Go for entertainment news. <laughs> this is so sad. Kim Kardashian files for divorce from Kanye West. <laughs> love to love. Whatever. Love file for divorce. <laughs> So, yeah, wow. Honestly, I didn't think it was going to last as long <laughs> as it did. 
<laughs> I would have definitely been the under of, you know, I would not have given it uh, that. But anyway, Kim Kardashian has filed for the divorce from Kanye West after almost seven years of marriage. Um, but the sources at TMZ say that uh, it seems to be an amicable divorce. Kim is asking for joint legal and physical custody of the couple's four children. Uh, sources de- uh, tell TMZ that Kanye is fine with the joint custody arrangements and that uh, both Kim and he are committed to co-parenting together. Obviously, there were prenups involved, so I'm sure that's going to you know come out as to you know, who gets what. This will be Kim's third divorce. She was married to music producer Damon Thomas before they divorced in 2004. And then she was married uh, to Humphreys. uh, I don't remember what his first name was, the basketball player um, in August of 2011 and filed for divorce only after 72 days. So, hey, lasted longer you know this time around this is her longest one and this is obviously kanye's first divorce so there you go you never you never wish for anyone to get divorced and on a from a celebrity standpoint it's kind of inevitable (laughs) right right but on a more serious note you know it was alleged that a lot of the issues that that happened between the two of them were a result of um mental health issues that right. Kanye West was having. Mm-hmm. And apparently she was trying to stick with him to get the help that he needed. And he was very resistant to that. Um, so this was the ultimate outcome of that. We hope that he does get the help mm-hmm. that he does Absolutely. need. Absolutely. If, if this is, you know, what caused it or, or whatever, and it brings him some help, then, you know, yep. all the better for that. And, you know, I'm sure both of them will, again, land fine on their feet. And I have no doubt about it. the next it. spouse. <laughs> Apparently, they, you know, she seems to be trying to collect them like a... Elizabeth she, Taylor. Yeah, she wants the whole collection. She wants the whole set. <laughs> so... Tell us about Walking Dead and why it's going to look different. So it seems when Walking Dead returns to AMC February 28th with six bonus episodes, they're going to feel a little bit different. For the first time, the series was actually shot digitally instead of on film. Um, the showrunner, Angela Kahn, had, uh, had said, yes, these episodes were filmed on digital um, when they had uh, talked about extending season 10 uh, during the pandemic. She said the decision uh, came about because there were fewer touch points with digital than with 16 millimeter. We don't have to swap out uh, every few minutes, for example. So if you're a fan of the show, it's, you know, it's kind of a big deal. Um, In 2016, the uh, Walking Dead cinematographer Stephen Campbell had actually spoke with the American Society of Cinematographers in great detail about how they approached shooting the series, um, you know, that kind of developed over the the years that the show has been on. Um, he said that one of the things that drives the show is the fact that we shoot it on 16 millimeter film. Uh, he had said that after the first six episode season, the series briefly considered filming on digital before deciding to stick with the film. He said they did some tests with digital format um, be, uh, during the second season, but decided that it just didn't look right. Um, it it just wasn't part of the show. So they went back to the 16 millimeter um, because it has that, um, you know, additional grain. It has some motion blur um, and it kind of just adds to that whole horror vibe of the show. Um, in June of 2019, um, Angela had had told Variety that they were considering using digital again, but decided to continue using the 16 millimeter because it just added that zombie look, you know, to it. Um, But now the show, because of health reasons, has gone to the fully digital. Um, They said that they've been doing a lot more pros post-production work to kind of add in that look to it. 
Um, she said, we will continue doing digital on season 11, but using post-production techniques to maintain our classic Walking Dead feel. Uh, the show had switched, again, like I had said, um, during the final episodes in one of the precautions that AMC is taking during filming the pandemic. Other changes that they uh, had made was they enlisted a former army medic and infectious disease specialist to the show to help with all the health and safety uh, concerns that they have with having such a big cast. Um, they said, we've even set up our own lab so we can process tests so there's no delay um, in, in testing everybody. Uh, there's no more shared makeup trailer, um, you know, where everybody would be kind of sitting right next to each other doing karaoke in the morning. Now everybody's in little pods. They're all next to each other with little windows so everybody can still see each other. But everybody is obviously keeping um, their distance um, from it. The other thing, too, is they have specific paths that everybody has to walk through so that this way nobody's running into anybody. So cast goes down this way. And, you know, it's like this whole military operation, really, you know, when you think about it. And I'm sure all the other shows, you know, that are filming at this time are, are kind of doing uh, the same thing. The other thing that was kind of interesting that they talked about in the article is this is the first time that all three Walking Dead shows are actually being filmed at the same time. Normally, um, you know, you film one, they take a little break, they go and film the other, they take a break, they film... But because of, you know, the COVID restrictions, they kind of are all filming um, at the same time, different locations, but they're all filming um, right now. So it'll be interesting to see what, you know, what this actually does look like. You know, will we be able to see a bit of difference uh, in the way that they're they're filming? And we don't have much longer to see. It'll be February 28th on AMC. If you have AMC Plus, you can actually start watching uh, the first episode starting February 21st. Interesting. I, I would not have thought the switch to digital would have been for health reasons. Um, but I, I can understand having fewer touch points, not having to swap right. film and so forth. Right. Um, we filmed the podcast all digital here. Mm hmm. Um, so it's, it is nice to not have to worry about, popping, right, right. you know, tapes in and stuff like that. Um, but any effect that you're going to look for, you can definitely achieve, mm -hmm. you know, via computer post-processing. Right, you know, right. We can, we can do a lot of the same things, you know, in our post-processing if we, uh, if we chose to do it. So uh, I'm sure it'll probably look different, but it's really not the film process that is what makes the show what it right. is it's, it's the, the writing show on itself. the show and the right. actors mm -hmm. on the show yeah um but you know playing it safe do it at the last season mm -hmm. you know for health reasons and you've got a couple of shows that are going to continue on after this you've got new yep. shows that are going to continue after this and if it works out you know it's probably a much more cost effective solution as well yeah than, yeah than doing it on film as well so mm -hmm. should be interesting yeah we shall see so let's talk about a wardrobe that is helping people out. Yeah, this was a really sweet story. So Alex Trebek's wardrobe is being donated to a homeless organization for job interviews. 14 suits, 58 dress shirts, 300 neckties, and various other items of clothing that once belonged to the Jeopardy host have now been donated by the show and the Trebek family to the Doe Fund, which is an organization that provides paid work, housing, vocational training, continuing education, and comprehensive social services for undeserving Americans um, with histories of uh, addiction, homelessness, and incarceration. So at the suggestion of Trebek's son, Matthew, a supporter of the Doe Fund, uh, the clothing will be distributed to participants in the organization's Ready, Willing, and Able re-entry program to be worn on job interviews. So during the, his last days on set, Alex had 
been, you know, talking about the virtues of everyone opening up their hands and their hearts to those who are suffering. Uh, This was a quote from Mike Richards, who was the executive producer of Jeopardy. He said, donating his wardrobe to those who are working to rebuild their lives is a perfect way to honor that last request. Uh, The garments were packed up by Matthew and the Jeopardy uh, costumer on... um, you know, one of the uh, a couple of of weeks ago, um, and again, it was shirts, polo shirts, sweaters, sports coats, belts, a parka. Not really sure why he needed a parka in. He used to do on site. Oh, that's things right. For the Double Jeopardy one. That's true. He would go out. All right, that yeah. would make sense why he would have. I was kind of like, why did he need a parka? That that was kind of okay. Um, so. Uh, uh, the president of the uh, Doe Fund had said, we are so grateful for Jeopardy and for the Trebek, uh, Trebek family's commitment to lifting up those vul- uh, most vulnerable around us. Uh, she had said, the men in our career training program are always in need of professional attire so they can shine in their job interviews and work with confidence once they're hired. Uh, the donation... <clears throat> excuse me, alleviates the obstacle of not having appropriate clothing. Uh, Harriet McDonald, who is the president of uh, the Doe Fund, had said, we understand the enormous loss that Matt and Jean are going through, as well as the incredible resilience uh, in facing the hardship. Last week, the Doe Fund's founder and president of 35 years, my husband, George McDonald, had passed away. I'm thankful that George got to see Alex's suits delivered to the people we serve before he left us. This generous gift honors the legacies of both men, and I know that they're both smiling down on us. That's a nice story. Mm-hmm. It's nice to see, you know, I, and, and Alex Trebek was heavily involved in various charities. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, during his time, he was, he was a, the type of individual who absolutely used his celebrity and notoriety mm-hmm. to help others. And this is just a, a, a great, you know, conclusion to that. Absolutely. A way for him to kind of live on and help these men better themselves and, yeah. you know as well so very good mm-hmm. that was all we had for entertainment news yep we will be right back with our insightful picks of the week oh no we have one more story no did you take it out oh no this is your pick sorry <laughs> sorry i'm all, sorry i was like no I think we're good. I'm all right. I'm a little confused. I'm good. I'm I'm confuzzled. It's okay. Uh, It's all good. Go with your insightful pick now that I screwed up the intro. (laughs) Sure. So my insightful pick is a show that is actually on CNN, which, you know, you wouldn't really think it's on, you know, a a news network. Um, But it is called Stanley Tucci's. Searching for Italy. Uh, it premiered last Sunday night. Uh, it's on Sundays at nine o'clock on CNN. Um, and it's it's kind of a travel show, kind of a food show, a little bit of history. Um, and what it is is Stanley Tucci uh, kind of wants to put it straight about you know, what is Italy? Uh, it is, is it a land where the sun always shines? Uh, is there lots of plates of, you know, spaghetti uh, with Parmesan? Do you have lots of um, uh, chicken parm, which chicken parm isn't even an Italian dish? So it, it's kind of interesting because you see that he has this great love for Italy. Uh, Both of his parents are originally from Italy. He's been there, um, you know, a a number of times um, since his childhood. He actually first uh, spent a year in Italy when his father decided to take a year sabbatical uh, from, he was an art teacher uh, in New York and decided he wanted to go study art in Italy for a year. So he packed up his family and, you know, he Stanley, as a young child, went to Italian school, you know, for a year and and just had this, you know, love with it. Um, so it's that's kind of what the the show is, is doing. Um, they actually had come up with the show before the pandemic, had actually started filming a bunch of it before everything had happened. 
and then actually um, hadn't finished the series, but went back after uh, things had opened back up in the pandemic. So they talk a a little bit about how life has changed, um, where... Uh, you know, they, they, the one thing they talk about is life in Italy. It was always very regional. You're from this part of Italy. You're from this part of Italy. You'll, you know, like you're from here, you're from here, you're from here. And that after everything with the pandemic, it became, we're all Italian. We're all from Italy. Like it, it, it kind of helped to, to bond them all together, which is something you haven't really seen you know, a lot of other countries do, and especially after how many deaths, you know, they they had and, and everything that they went through, you know, with COVID and, and whatnot. But it's interesting because, again, it's not just um, a cooking show. There's, you know, you, you hear the story of, you know, the the person that, that's preparing this meal and how they prepare it and, you know, and, and how many generations back, you know, this meal ha- has gone and, and how much it's meant to them. And, and um, you know, and, and you're hungry <laughs> once you're done. You're like, I want that. <laughs> and you know that you can't get it any place here. So it's like, hmm, yeah. But just uh, so well done. And, and I've only seen the one episode so far. So definitely looking forward to um, watching it again, you know, the, the other episodes and, and seeing where else the journey takes us throughout Italy. Nice. Good pick. Thank you. Even though I screwed it up. No problem. I'll forgive you. Thanks. So my pick this week is a documentary, but it's not a stuffy history or science documentary like I usually do. Oh, well, that's good. This one is a Marvel documentary. uh, Marvel 616 on Disney+. Plus. Marvel 616 explores Marvel's rich legacy of pioneering characters, creators, and storytelling to reflect the world outside your window. Each documentary, helmed by a unique filmmaker, showcases the intersections of storytelling, pop culture, and fandom within the Marvel Universe. Episodes in this anthology series will cover topics including Marvel's world-spanning artists, the trailblazing women of Marvel Comics, discovering the forgotten characters of Marvel, and much more. I'm about uh, four episodes, five episodes in right now. And and it's interesting because each episode is done very different than the previous one. But it's, as with anything Marvel, there's a story behind it. So there's a there's a story, there's a, there's a premise in the beginning. And then they take you through the story and you have various chapters and they sum it up at the end there. And the one that really, I think, the, the two were that, that were outstanding so far. One was the Women of Marvel. And, and this one went back to even the early days of female involvement in Marvel where comic book artists and, and producers and editors and everybody – um, it was all, it was a male environment and, and they talked to some of the very early female artists that get involved and how they got involved and, and almost by accident, you know, like they, this, you know, one particular woman happened to be an artistically inclined individual, got a job working at Marvel, but not doing anything. She was almost like a secretarial role and they had a deadline that had to be met and she would um, in her spare time, sort of scribble and someone saw how, how, you know, talented she was. And when this deadline came up and they didn't have an artist that could meet the deadline, they handed it off to her and, and she wound up running with it. And and that's sort of what started the whole thing. And they take you all the way up until uh, modern times where you've got women playing a major role. And, and they're playing a major role, not just with female characters, they're playing a major role telling the story of a lot of the key male characters that are out there now. But some of the female characters are ones that are being helmed by these female artists. And it, with anything with Marvel, it injects that sense of realism, that sense of perspective in there, uh, which Marvel's always been famous for. Uh, another episode talked about their international 
um, artists from around the world. And they had, they highlighted two artists from uh, Spain that were, um, again, one was a freelancer and one was someone who was desperate to break in. And it was a great lesson in persistence. You know, they, they were, they took time off from their job to dedicate themselves to their work. And after about six months, when they were just about ready to give up, they wound up getting their foot in the door with the right person. And now they're, you know, they're doing tours of comic cons and, they're, they've got their roles. So it was a very inspiring uh, documentary to watch. And I highly recommend it if you're interested in comics. If you want to be a, a comic book artist, I sat down with our daughter to watch the Women of Marvel episode. And I think she took a lot away from that um, for for inspiration. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in watching the rest of the episodes in the series as well. So... Marvel 616, streaming now on Disney+. Plus. So that was all we had today. Mm -hmm. um, before we go, I would invite folks to subscribe to the podcast to get the audio versions of the podcast. Look for us as Insights into Entertainment. Video versions are listed as Insights into Things, anywhere you get your normal podcast from. Um, we also encourage you to reach out to us and give us your feedback. You can email us at comments at insights into things.com. You can find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We stream six days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. We're on Instagram at insights into things. Uh, the audio versions of all of our podcasts are at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. You can get high-res versions of our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. And if you forget every place to look for us and you just want to go to our main website, that is insightsintothings.com. And that's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye.